Wow, just wow. Yay for the refund policy. It's too late for me. Please don't play this. Microsoft PowerPoint cutscenes. I don't even want my ops playing this game. These, <clears throat> these are some of the reviews placed on our topic of today's video. A game that is so bad that even IGN reviewers couldn't find a way to give it a 7. Or anything close. I'm of course talking about The Walking Dead Destinies. Published by Game Mill, the legends behind 2023's worst game of the year, Skull Island Rise of Kong, The Walking Dead Destinies does such a bad job at just about everything that it can't even be the best at being bad, which I find beautiful. But though I've seen a video or two of people playing this game for about 10 minutes, I've never really gotten to understand the full reason as to why this game game got a 2 out of 10. Why this game is sitting at a 17% rating overall, and most importantly, why this game is $50. For the sake of investigative journalism, I booted up my PS5 and spent some of my hard-earned cash so that I can play through this entire experience myself. And no matter how many bad games I've bragged about beating in my entire life, nothing could have prepared me for this one. So how bad is The Walking Dead Destinies actually? Well, we're about to find out. Before we continue the video, I have to talk to you about today's sponsor, Repeat.gg. Repeat.gg is one of the largest eSport tournament platforms, where users can compete for cash, in-game currency, or prizes alongside other online games. It's owned by PlayStation, making it a trustworthy platform, and it's incredibly easy to use. All you gotta do is enter a tournament and then play your best in your own games. Simple enough. It also only records your best scores, so if you're somebody who likes to grind and play a lot of games, then have no fear because it'll only record your 10 best. That sounds a little complicated, but basically playing more will only make your score go up and not down. Users can even enter multiple tournaments at the same time and all of your results will be tracked. There's plenty of games to choose from, including PUBG, Brawl Stars, Dota 2, and even League of Legends. If you're someone like myself who would rather lose their entire epidermal than ever play solo queue again, then have no fear. They added a weekly ARAM Cups so you can still chill in Howling Abyss and compete to earn prizes. Then you can turn your wins into credits that you could use in the marketplace to redeem prizes. I mean, if you're gonna be gaming anyway, why not add the spice of competition to really liven things up? Check out repeat.gg from my link in the description below and I'll be seeing you on the leaderboards. Our journey begins with Rick Grimes waking up from a coma after the zombie apocalypse. A quick thing to note here, the only graphic setting they let you change in this game is either leaving the film grain at default or turning it off. To get the authentic experience, I decided to leave it at default, so if the footage ever looks a little bit deep fried, don't worry, your graphics card isn't giving out, that's just the way the game is meant to be played. We get a feel for the controls, which is a lot like like The Last of Us, and that's actually pretty good. After grabbing meds off the counter to heal, we use them and the screen just kinda goes black, and then it fades back in. I assume that they're padding for time so that people can't beat this game under refund percent like we did in our last video, but I digress. We walk for another 7 seconds and get another screen fade. But at least this time, we get a cutscene, and our first glimpse at Rick Grimes. I'm sorry for laughing, but this is how Rick Grimes looks in the TV show. And oh this <laughs> is how he looks in this game. That's not Rick Grimes at all. That's my boy, Rock Grimms. Wow. Why is he so kawaii, right? Am I tripping? Is he not a little cutie? Doesn't he look, doesn't he look like a cool little Funko Pop Rick Grimes? He does, right? This next part made me laugh because it's supposed to be a sneaking tutorial, but the enemies spot you before the game teaches you how to sneak. I don't think that's how tutorials are supposed to work. We find out we have a role that makes us invulnerable, making this one of the more expensive Souls likes. We head outside and it's a another sneaking section, but there's almost no reason to because the zombies are so slow. Like, they're practically walking. Oh, fuck. We finally get a cutscene in the style that is going to be used for 90% of this game, and I'm just going to let you experience it with me. There's a sheriff's cruiser just up the road. <laughs> I don't think they're I animated. I don't 
about this. Then you need to know about the I don't think they're animated. Now, I'm not against still image PowerPoint cutscenes. In fact, I've seen this done a lot of times before very tastefully, with starbursts or random effects or whatever. The issue here is that they just pose the character models from the game itself and basically do nothing else. Which makes me think that they were supposed to animate all of these, but just decided against it in the last second. And that really begs the question, why is this game a 43 gigabyte download? I almost wish that somebody just used their cell phone camera and recorded the show itself off of their TV instead. We get our knife, which allows us to sneak attack and finish our enemies, but they only animated like one finishing attack, so enemies always end up randomly magnetizing and flying into position so that you can do your one move. We also find our first melee weapon, the baseball bat, which, spoiler alert, is gonna be our best friend this entire run. Though the combat in this game isn't great by any stretches of the imagination, I'll admit, the hits do feel a little zesty, with the heavy swings having a larger impact than this game had on my wallet. Okay, I'll stop mentioning the price now, I promise. You have this execution meter, which lets you do a special finisher and recover health once it's full, which is a cool concept in theory, and I hope it becomes more important later on. Let's boil it. This game has a stamina bar, which I normally love because it gives you something to think about, but you run out of stamina here incredibly fast. Like, has Rick Grimes ever done cardio in his life? Did he just wake up from a coma or something? Oh, fuck. After a dozen magnetized knife finishers and a satisfying baseball bat double kill, we clear the first stage and get another PowerPoint cutscene followed by text. This is a tiny nitpick and it doesn't really matter, but this line of text is the first time you find out that Morgan's name is Morgan. And I'm not even gonna blame the devs for that one, it's just kinda rude to not introduce yourself, bro. There's also some grammar issues here and there which are gonna be prevalent throughout the entire game, but but I'm not an English teacher, so I don't care. The next stage begins, and we get this prompt that says choose your destiny, basically telling us that you could either use stealth or combat to get through this game, which is a cool concept in theory, but the stealth is so buggy and almost never worth it. Stealth also requires you to throw bottles, which is a pain because sometimes you aim with the right analog stick, but other times you randomly aim with the left one. There's no way to trigger the difference either, it's just entirely random. I press the pause button and see this absolutely massive Path of Exile level skill tree. But I don't have a single skill point yet, which kinda scares me. Either leveling up is going to be a terrifying grind, or the skill system is going to be a buggy mess. Hopefully, I'm wrong. Rick's voice lines are pretty repetitive, always saying only one out of three things anytime he does anything. But I kinda like it because it reminds me of old arcade games where the announcer would only say one line whenever you got a power up. I tried to throw a bottle at the enemy itself to see how much damage it would deal, but then it phased through, which is awesome. Then I tried another bottle, which made me drop more frames than an optometrist clinic in an earthquake. When you get low health in this game, you fall into a broken state which gives you a randomized debuff, some being way worse than others, like completely disabling your dodge roll which is fatal in most cases. We run into an actual swarm of zombies and it's kind of impressive because there's actually a lot of them. At least it would be impressive if Dead Rising didn't do this better 18 years ago, with less frame drops. Uh, and and sharper graphics. I get caught and drop into a broken state, and then we get the debuff that removes my dodge roll entirely so I physically can't escape and suffer my first death. Then we get an actually animated cutscene for some reason where Rick hides under a tank surrounded by zombies. Here's where we meet my favorite character from the show. Glenn himself, or at least the idea of him, because boy, who hey, is yo, this? Now, if you're wondering how Glenn plays differently from Rick, he doesn't.
Moving on. We get through a horde of zombies again, roll under a barrier, and learn something that I absolutely despise. Turns out that the skill points in this game aren't attached to your kills at all. Instead, they're attached to random items that are hidden around the map. Which basically means that I'm gonna have to actually look around if I want to level up my characters. Yippee. Now, I'm gonna take a quick second to explain to you how the skill tree actually works in this game. Basically, whenever somebody joins your party, they come with a skill tree that you could spec into that affects your entire party. Glenn, for example, comes with move speed while crouching. If a party member ends up leaving your team or being killed, you can no longer level up that skill tree, but you keep the buffs that you evolved before they left. That's going to be important later on. We beat Glenn's segment and it must be Christmas because we get another animated cutscene of Glenn distracting the zombies with a fire truck siren. Then we escape as Rick and climb onto a rooftop where we see Wish.com T-Dog arguing with Make-A-Wish Meryl. Meryl mounts T-Dog after a scuffle and now we're forced to make a decision. Either we defuse the situation and keep Meryl around or handcuff Meryl and possibly leave him to die. I choose to defuse the situation because why not keep them both around and unlock both of their skill trees. Rick tells them both to chill out and they all walk downstairs together. But then Meryl handcuffs T-Dog to the pipe and leaves him to die? What do you think's gonna happen when you show up without me? It's a dangerous world out there, Mr. Yo. People go missing all the time. Wait, <laughs> wait, wait. <laughs> Wait, hold up. Rick and Glenn literally just left. Like, they're probably eight feet away, tops. Do they lack object permanence? Is Meryl gonna tell them that T-Dog got lost somewhere in the eight feet it took him to catch up to them? Like, it's so confusing. <laughs> we get another wall of text that explains that Shane looked after Rick's wife and son while Rick was in a coma, and that Shane and Rick's wife developed feelings because they thought that Rick was dead. And now we get to play as Shane. And believe it or not, here's where things start to go completely off the rails. For starters, since T-Dog dog was killed off by Meryl, his skill tree is now locked forever, which is annoying because they never showed me what was on the table before I even made that decision. And if I want to know what I lost, the game won't tell me either because he's dead. So hopefully, it wasn't too great. <laughs> I run around and find skill points in this stage, level up a skill, and end up dying. But when I start back at the last checkpoint, the skill point items respawn and I still keep my skills leveled up? Meaning that if you just collect skill points, level up your abilities, and restart from last checkpoint, you can get infinite skill points and be max level by like the third stage in the game. This wasn't even something that I had to look up. I just tried it and it worked. <laughs> So I do the infinite XP glitch for a bit, level a few things in my tree, and continue onwards. Also, Shane says my favorite line in the entire game here. That Carl would like this place. Maybe we could catch some frogs. <laughs> like... <laughs> what the fuck was that? We also accidentally learned that zombies don't know how to climb up anything, which would have ended the show in like three episodes if these idiots just tried it out. We finished Shane's stage where all you had to do was grab fruit, and then Lori says this. Hurry on back, you promised Carl some frog catching. Tell him I'm on my way. What's with the fucking frogs? Is Carl some sort of amphibian enthusiast and I just missed that part in the show? <laughs> we get a cutscene back at camp where Rick, Glenn, and Meryl meet up with the group. And that's when Lori realizes that her husband has been alive this entire time. Then Lori snaps at Shane for supposedly lying to her about Rick's death. This should be a massive moment that is full of emotion, but instead it looks like this. We get our first look at the overworld slash camp life of this game, uh, and, and it's nothing. Every time you return to camp, you're forced to solve a conflict between two people, but your choices don't really seem to matter. Like at all. 
I purposefully screwed Carl over whenever I had the chance, and nothing ever changed. Which is the overarching theme for this game. Before missions, you can choose characters to send out on an expedition, but believe it or not, these don't matter either. It's just a prompt that pops up during your main mission with a 50-50 gamble which either gives you skill points or doesn't. And if you really want those skill points, yes, you can restart from checkpoint and try again. Also, if you accidentally skip the prompt too fast, even if you made the right choice, you end up not getting the skill points anyway. It just bugs out and gives you nothing. Finding this out is where I started to feel a lot less bad about breaking this game. We were in a standoff to see who would crack first. This game's code, or my sanity. We skill point dupe for about an hour to fully level every skill tree we had available, and then we beat the next mission. There's a cutscene where we narrowly escape a swarm of zombies in a truck, and it's even more terrifying when you realize that all the zombies are doing the exact same animation at the same time. Which has to signify a, a deeper meaning where all of these zombies are secretly linked to one consciousness and moving in a hive mind. Nah, they got lazy. The screen fades to black, and then we listen to zombies moan for about three minutes straight. Until we accept the fact that the game somehow softlocked us, and we had to close it out and start again. I want you to guess how many times I got softlocked in my run. Go ahead, pause the video, and guess. Fortunately, our reload started after the soft lock, so we didn't really lose any progress. The next mission, we run through the forest to find Sophie, and it's also the first time I get to see how strong I've gotten from my power leveling. My baseball bat swing now fully clears zombies as if Rick's ancestry was tied to Doomslayer. Now here's something that's just completely confusing. Shane and Rick get into a light argument when Carl notices a deer. Then. Out of nowhere, Carl is shot and the deer is dead, with no explanation. They run to Herschel's farm and ask for help because Carl is bleeding out from his gunshot wound. And the cutscenes never really show us what happened. In the show, this happens because a very important character named Otis shoots through the deer and accidentally hits Carl. In the game, however, Otis doesn't exist. No reference, no PowerPoint cutscene, no NPC at camp, nothing. He is just retconned entirely. So if you play this game without knowing the show itself, or if you forgot because season 2 was 11 years ago, this makes it look like the deer was a gunslinger himself. You do get half a line of text after the fact, but it's a very big thing for them to not really talk about or show. Believe it or not, when you're retelling a story, you kind of have to I don't know, tell the story? We reach the farm area where we get two new characters added to our party. Maggie, whose skill tree evolves our crowbar, and Beth, whose skill tree evolves the machete. We're sent to a school to get medical supplies for Carl, and if you notice that I'm talking less and less about the gameplay from this point on, it's because there's nothing to really talk about. It almost feels like the missions themselves were done before the devs even knew the story, and then they managed to snag a Walking Dead license two hours before release. We get to choose between Maggie and Beth to send out into the mission, and I choose Maggie because why not? In this mission, we're introduced to the Heavy Walker, a tank zombie that doesn't exist in the series, but I think he's cute, so we're gonna let him rock. Then we're given a choice to either save Maggie from the walkers or retrieve the medical supplies to save Carl and let Maggie die. I'm not a heartless monster, so I at least say goodbye before letting her be eaten to death. We head back to camp, and now Maggie's skill tree is locked forever, which shouldn't really matter as long as I don't pick up a crowbar anytime soon. This next mission makes absolutely no sense. It's Shane's last day seeing Rick and trying to save him during the apocalypse. You walk around a hospital, kill zombies, and also military personnel? 
Are you telling me that before the zombies even fully took over the world, Shane was okay with bashing in human skulls like pinatas? Maybe he does deserve to die. I think it's now a good time for me to bring this part up, but every single character not only plays exactly the same, they all have the exact same lines of dialogue for every action as well. Which I'm assuming happened because they only rented the studio for about two hours? I've also never mentioned aiming in this game, but it's probably the worst I've ever experienced. And I used to play Turok too. Sometimes your character just strafes and the crosshair doesn't move. Sometimes the crosshair glitches and just shun pose in a random direction. And if it weren't for this Call of Duty level aim assist, I don't even think I'd be able to beat this game at all. We finish the flashback and head back to the farm, where Glenn reveals to the group that their barn is full of walkers. A and just look at this reaction. I'm on the edge of my low poly seat here. Shane snaps at Rick and takes the leadership position. And we have to do our first big puzzle in the game, which is moving six of the exact same box models out of the way, down to the tire and wooden crate on top of it. They literally just copy and pasted it six times. And another spoiler, this happens a lot and is the only type of puzzle that exists in this entire game. And now it's time for the legendary Sophia reveal, where it is unfortunately found out that this little girl that they've been searching everywhere for has been a zombie in the barn the entire time. Once again, the emotions here are non-existent. The game does such a bad job at explaining what's happening that I don't even think it's possible to follow what's going on if you never watch the show. We get a text wall that says that tensions between Rick and Shane have to give, and that there's no turning back now. Which is incredibly sudden because they've only lightly argued in this game like twice. And they weren't even bad arguments. Shane leads Rick into the forest where he plans to kill him. This canonically happens because Shane snaps and goes completely insane. We're given a choice between the two, which is actually pretty cool because it allows you to define your protagonist for the rest of the game. I side with Rick because his main weapon is the baseball bat, which is insanely overpowered. And now we have a boss fight. They try to do this emotional thing where they play voice lines while you're fighting to try to make you feel something, but none of these voice lines were ever said in the game. Some of them are just completely random. Like Shane saying, yo, Rick, there was this chick at the bar. Fucking awesome, man. Sometimes the lines even loop. Rick kills Shane just like in the show, and then the farm catches on fire, sending our group into the cold, dead world. Or not, because it softlocked me again. And this time, I actually have to play the entire boss fight another time. Now here's where I had to do a bit of research because I was genuinely curious about the difference in the story whenever you choose Rick or Shane. And the answer is almost nothing. The majority of their dialogue is nearly identical as well. <laughs> this is a step beyond the illusion of choice. This is the illusion of everything else as well. Our next mission is to break into the prison, which is the last arc of the game. And in turn, they start to really stretch out these levels. There's nothing worth noting though, because they're all very cookie cutter. Except for this hilarious bug we encountered, if you have the crowbar, aka the only item that I could not level up because the skill tree is tied to Maggie's death, you can't swap to another weapon at all. I don't know why, it's almost as if the game is laughing at me and forcing me to stick with the one thing I couldn't make overpowered. And this unfortunately happens for about half of my final run. We meet a prisoner named Andrew who's kind of a shady suspect, but when allowed to choose, I end up going against Carol's wishes and decide to keep him around to hopefully get another skill tree. He agrees to pull his weight around the prison and we continue our story only to realize that he doesn't have a skill 
skill tree. So what was the point of that choice? Our party member Herschel gets bit by a zombie and we're forced to amputate his leg. Andrew, being a bastard, starts messing with things and reveals that we should have never trusted him to begin with. Carol tells Lori that she's gonna go investigate and she is unfortunately killed by Andrew who then runs into the basement, making me feel the weight of my action going against Carol's wishes. I keep dying here for some reason without taking any damage, and I think it's because it was a timed event, but the game never tells you it's a timed event. What just happened? We finally get to the basement and are ambushed by Andrew and sent into another boss fight, which is essentially walking randomly through a very dense fog to deactivate generators and then fight. After defeating this bastard, we head back to Lori who just had our baby and the camera sadly pans over Carol's dead body. And I know what you might be asking, if we never saved Andrew, would the boss fight just not happen? Well I checked, and you want to know what the difference is, if you side with Carol, she lives. That's it, that's the only difference. And no offense to Carol, but she never really talks anyway, so it's not like she's gonna be missed from the story. Now, I'm gonna start speedrunning here because the game is clearly not gonna get any better. We're introduced to Michonne, who tells us that Daryl has been captured by the governor and his weird town of followers. Then we're sent into a flashback, which is extra awesome because the first five minutes of this mission is following around an NPC and having an insanely slow conversation. Conversation. And if you miss anything, don't worry, because chances are the game will crash and then send you back to the beginning of the mission where you have to sit down and listen to these characters talk for another five minutes. My yeah, favorite part about group. this conversation we'll though is that well, sometimes the NPCs talk out of order well, instead of having a cohesive talk. So sometimes a character would say yeah, all of their lines in a row without letting the other NPC interject and then the other character says, all their lines in a row. At least they're polite. Michonne learns the ins and outs of the city and decides that the vibe is off. We get a minute long cutscene where only one sentence is said. This game is so good at padding for time, it may as well start a YouTube channel. Then we get forced into a sneak section of the game that is so painfully boring, I'm not gonna get into it. Michonne learns that she was right about the vibe when she goes to the governor's office and finds a bunch of decapitated heads and his zombie daughter. I killed the daughter zombie because why not? And in turn, it makes the governor flip out and become a foe. Michonne stabs him in the eye and escapes, and we sneak out of Woodbury into the present day. Then we're thrown into a boss fight against T-Dog as the captured Daryl. We defeat T-Dog, Rick and his crew show up with smoke bombs and start the rescue. And I know that this boss fight was supposed to be like a big moment where you feel the weight of your actions, but T-Dog doesn't really say or do anything. It's it's just his character model. The next mission is probably the most annoying in the entire game because you have to destroy seven military vehicles while random enemies spawn and try to kill you. These enemies have guns too, which is pretty annoying, but they don't really do that much damage. Everyone hates a bullet sponge, but have you ever wondered how that bullet sponge feels? Having to sit there and be shot a million times only to be shot again? Let me be the first to tell you, it's not great. We beat the stage after like 30 minutes of failed attempts, get a cutscene of the governor seeing his city burn, and get ready for what will definitely be our last big battle of the game. But then we get two more missions before it, because why not? There's a mission where we have to clear zombies in the jail, and then another mission where we go back to Rick's hometown to get supplies. We have a reunion with Morgan where he gives us guns but decides to stay on his own, and then we head back to prison. There is yet another mission where we're all off to find supplies in some random building and the enemies end up catching Glenn and Michonne. And now it's finally time for our grand finale, which starts off with this super insane cutscene of all the characters walking and nothing else. You, you, you know that they put 90% of the budget of this game into that one shot. Hell yeah. The governor shows up with a tank and demands Rick's group to evacuate the premises. Rick pleads for the governor to allow everyone to stay so that they can work together. And we're given a choice between Glenn and Michonne to convince the governor to calm down. I choose Glenn because he seems to be the better talker of the two and he gets decapitated. 
Then we have to boss fight a tank. And wait a fucking second, that's Carol. She died. She was literally killed in my playthrough. They did a whole cutscene about it. We mourned her. Oh my god. She's the walking dead. So not only do your choices not really matter, but sometimes they get retconned mid-game. Daryl destroys the tank with a grenade, which lights a fire circle in which Rick and the governor fight to the death. We defeat the governor and kill him for murdering Glenn, and the mission and game are still somehow not over. We play as Michonne and walk through a literal fire maze to reach a sniper tower. And then this happens. They got me. Help! Were you loading in the zombies? Yeah, I have absolutely no clue what that was either. Michonne just straight up teleported to the top of the watchtower, but I guess it broke the game because I have nothing to shoot at, forcing us to completely reload again. It starts us off on top of the watchtower, so thankfully we don't lose progress. And I looked it up by the way, that's just what happens. The character just teleports in. Then why did they say that? I, I thought it was setting up another part of the mission. We use a sniper rifle to cover fire for Rick and Daryl, escape the prison as Michonne, and finally get to our last cutscene of the game, which I'm gonna let you experience with me. And there's Meryl. First appearance in the game since the first appearance in the game. Did we, is that it? Is the game over? I wonder what song they're gonna play for the credits. Yeah, they didn't bother to animate anything, and there's also no music during the credits. When you make a game about choices, the final moments are supposed to be so important. They're supposed to be spent sitting back and realizing what you've done, feeling the weight of all you've decided while learning how to live with what you've lost. And in this case, Remembering the entire tale we've been through over the course of our run. I, I, I honestly felt it in my heart. The, the emptiness of everything we gave up. $50 and 8 hours of my life. I've played my fair share of bad games. I honestly can say that sometimes I prefer playing bad games over good ones. But this game wasn't just bad. It was terrible and may in fact be the worst game I have ever played. Selling something in this state should be a crime. And I'm sorry for talking to you about it, but if I don't share my experience, I'm gonna fucking explode. So now, please do me a favor and tell me about your experience. Let me know in the comments section about the worst game that you've actually beaten. If I see one that stands out, then I'll probably make a video on it because I'm honestly enjoying making this kind of content. Thank you so much for watching. Here's a link to my second channel, and here's a link to a video I think you might enjoy. Go ahead, click on it. Click on it, it's a good one. Go click it. Click that video. Get over there. Click the video. It's good. It's good.